Hello everybody and welcome to the Little Woman podcast. Here are the common shoutouts and the first one goes to Loli. 19th century Germany was very different from 20th century Germany. Back in Victorian times, it was supposed to be a romantic country. In the same way France is considered romantic by Americans today. It was the cradle of the romantic literary movement and people used to go there in order to get the best musical education. Nat goes to Germany as a way of polishing his musical training. In Joe's voice, there is an interesting description of Germany. I have found the contrast very striking. It is so different from what people think of Germany today. I also love German culture, but when I tell people I am learning German, they look at me in distrust like I have some sort of sympathy for the regime, which is not true. My mother, who studied world literature, used to tell me how Germans studied and analyzed Hitler's discourses at school to avoid falling for such leaders again. And they never did. But some people are willfully ignorant and want to believe falsehoods no matter what. The second comment shout-out goes to Kevin. Quote, As a German, I can confirm everything you said. Germans learn in school mostly about World War II and also very one-sided. Great achievements of the German people in the pre-World War eras get little attention and in general will be presented very critical of the Germans. This created generations of self-hating Germans, which are often severely uneducated of their own history except World War II, of course. Anything presenting German, Germany, patriotism, etc. as positive will usually get called Nazi by the left wing. It is quite sad, really. I just visited Berlin last week and I thought about this a lot. I do wish that people would have a lot more nuanced way to look at German culture and hopefully this podcast can help to raise some awareness at least a little bit, because when Louisa May of Alcott was a young person, there was a certain air of romanticism connected to Germany. German literature and philosophy was important to her and inspired her. And without that, we wouldn't have Little Woman. And I bet a lot of other American books as well. Christina and I continue to discuss about the chapter Friend. One of the things that frustrate me in Little Woman research is that when people talk about this chapter, they say that Jo is a feminist hero when she writes sensational stories and that she is, quote, a victim of patriarchy because Friedrich does not like sensationalism. These are all things that Greta Gerwig has said in her interviews. But the more I do this podcast, the more I feel that she hasn't read Little Woman. And she used a so-called feminist card just to make money. When Christina and I started to dissect this chapter, it became more and more clear that, that Louisa does not represent this kind of work as feminist. It is the opposite. She's in a bad place mentally when she's working for this magazine. And Friedrich is really the hero in this chapter. The whole name of the chapter is Friend. And just think about it. There are millions of people who read Greta Gerwig's interviews and they read, oh, Friedrich forced Joe to stop writing, which never happens in the book. And then they read something that she says, oh, Joe wanted to write these sensational stories. Friedrich stopped her. So she lies to all of these people and she spreads false information about Little Woman and she spreads false information about Louis May Alcott. And people think that she's some kind of feminist who, quote, saves Joe. It's completely messed up. Anyway, in this chapter, Joe goes to work for a sensational magazine called Weekly Volcano. And in the chapter, Louisa May Alcott writes that Joe herself is ashamed of these stories that she's writing. And the editor calls her a hack and that Joe is easily disposable. If you are watching this on YouTube or some other place where you can leave comments, I would love to hear thoughts about this chapter. And do you think Joe is treated fairly in this magazine? Because 
I don't think she is. I also really want to thank Christina for taking the time to talk with me about this chapter for this podcast. It was a really good conversation and I hope you liked this episode. This is Little Woman Podcast, Joe March, sensational writer, underpaid and disposable. chapter where Joe publishes her first book, I think there is a mo- moment in the end where she literally says that she wishes that she had an unbiased person to look at her writing and give her some help. So that's such a clear foreshadowing for Friedrich's character. It's so important. I think in order to really advance as a writer or in any kind of artist, let's just say even like a filmmaker, actor, director, whatever, you're going to need someone with an unbiased opinion who's thinking, well, ultimately the end goal should be a good product or good story. So we got to do, we got to look at it and think what's best for the story, not what's best for your ego. True. Somebody commented on Tumble on this chapter that it reminded them of the university teachers when they gave them feedback. And I was like, that's a throwback. (laughs) Sometimes I was so frustrated with my university teachers, but then I know that they wanted me to do the best work that I could do in that moment. I remember um, we would have, when I went to my one school, we, or my uh, university teachers would have like a sort of mid-semester meeting where each of them would tell me how I'm doing in their class and say, well, you you could be doing better than this, but I, it's, you know, good to see that you're improving or, you know, good to see that you're trying hard or like you're lacking here, but, you know, you're doing better there or I wish you were a little bit more outgoing with this and you know have more confidence in yourself and you know in the end it is a healthy but you sit there and go like I was kind of hoping I get glowing reviews but in the end as much as you sit there thinking that you're like I, I in order to get the glowing reviews you got to take to heart what they say because they're not saying it maliciously they're saying it because they know you can do better And I think it's so important that we acknowledge that Jo, she hasn't really studied literature. And I was wondering, I don't think in this time period it was okay for a woman to study literature in general in in school or in in the university. So, like, basically Jo's education on literature is that she has been reading Goethe and writing. Yeah. It, it is not a wonder that she wants some kind of a future figure for her to her life. Yeah. She has never had any. Beginning when she's admiring this female writer whose name I now forgot, who made tons of money writing sensational stories. 
she thinks, oh, I can do that as well. And then she calls those stories trash because she knows that they are not good literature. But at the same time, she has that in her fight. She wants to be a good writer. She's, she wants to be a really good writer. But then how do you make money and become a good writer? It's that growth process and she doesn't really have any kind of education for this job because it wasn't available. Yeah, it's kind of like one of those things you have to sort of build experience in order to get experience. Like, you know, when they, like, on job applications, like, well, you need, we want you to be, you know, have this and this, but you have to have this experience. And it's like, well, I can't get that experience until you offer me that experience. And I think, yeah, I think Joe tries she doesn't know exactly how she can get the experience until she actually goes through it. She said not having the chance, even if she had money, I think, to, to go to a university to study literature. She would have to have someone went to college and relay what they learned to her in order to truly get the knowledge that she's seeking or, or as she has been studying books and trying to see what what makes it good and what makes this bad, what doesn't work and what doesn't. Can't blame her because she's just kind of, she wants to do this thing, but she just doesn't know where to start. And you just kind of have to dive right in and try your best. Even if you fall flat on your face hundreds of times, she's got to put her out there somehow. And if this is, and to her so far, this has been the only way that she's been able to really properly get published, even if it is sensational stories. It's a foot in the door, and it's money in the pocket. And it's kind of one of those things where it's like, well, I'll only do this for a short time, and then I'll really get to writing what I really want to write. When she went to get, Mr. Dashwood was alone, where she re rejoiced. Mr. Dashwood was much wider awake than before, which was agreeable, and Mr. Dashwood was not deeply absorbed in a cigar to remember his manners. So the second interview was much more comfortable than the first. We'll take this. Editors never say I. If you don't object to a few alternations, it is too long, but omitting the passages I've marked will make it just the right length, he said, in a business-like tone. She hardly knew her own MS again, so crumpled and underscored were its pages and paragraphs, but feeling as a tender parent might on being asked to cut off her baby's legs in order that it might fit into a new cradle, she looked at the marked passages and was surprised to find that all the moral reflections, which she had carefully put in a ballast for much romance, had all been stricken out. But, sir, I thought every story should have some sort of a moral, so I took care to have a few of my sinners repent. Mr. Dashwood's editorial gravity relaxed into a smile, for Joe had forgotten her French, and spoken as only an author could. People want to be amused, not preached at, you know. Morals don't sell nowadays, which was not quite a correct statement, by the way. You think it would do with these alternations, then? Yes, it's a new plot and pretty well worked up. Language is good, and so on, was Mr. Dashwood's affable reply. What do you do, that is, what compensation, began Jo, not exactly knowing how to express herself. Oh, yes, well, we give from twenty-five to thirty for things of this sort. Pay when it comes out, returned Mr. Dashwood, as if that point had escaped him. Such trifles often do escape the, ed the editorial mind, it is said. Very well, you can have it, said Cho, handing back the story with satisfied air, for after the dollar a column work, even twenty-five seemed good pay. Shall I tell my friend you will take another if she has one better than this, asked Cho, unconscious of her little slip of the tongue and emboldened, emboldened by her success. Well, we'll look at it. Can't promise to take it. Tell her to make it short and spicy, 
and never mind the moral. What name would your friend like to put it? In a careless tone. None at all, if you please. She doesn't wish her name to appear, and has a no, nom de plume, said Jo, blushing in spite of herself. Just as she likes, of course. The tale will be out next week. Will you call for the money, or shall I send it? asked Mr. Dashwood, who felt a natural desire to know who his new contributor might be. I'll call. Good morning, sir. As she departed, Mr. Dashwood put up his feet with a grateful remark. Poor and proud as usual, but she'll do. I wrote in one of my articles that Mr. Dashwood, in a way he treats Joe like she is disposable. Yeah. It, it does remind me of this content factories like BuzzFeed or these sort of internet houses which make content. They're like there has been lots of conversations recently that they don't pay enough for the creator, so it really reminds me of that. As soon as when he said what she'll do, I just go like, ugh. <laughs> like, like, I'm sure that Joe heard that she would have just been like, she'll do? I'll more than just do. I will. <laughs> like, but yeah, just, yeah, just, I, I just feel bad for her, even when she says her manuscript, that it, she hardly knew it, and past the description of feeling like a parent being asked to cut your baby's legs like that is so it's such a personal and like this is the, i i worked so hard to do this you know i i nurtured it i fed it i gave birth to it and now you want me to like hack it like so yeah i can definitely feel that frustration that pain that she feels because it's not even just like oh you have a little bit of a run-on sentence here or Instead of saying can't do, cannot, just full on hack it like it was a horror movie. Leatherface with his chainsaw just went rrr, rrr, rrr. so disheartening to her. It's again a foot in the door and money in her pocket, which, you know, as he says, poor and proud is kind of what she, you know, she needs money at that moment. Yeah, it's. It's funny because I've talked with some people who are like, oh, Louisa May, I love writing thrilling, thrilling stories. And I'm like, yeah, but it's the difference between the publications because she did not like to write this magazine. And there's the difference because she didn't like the editor and because they, they did take away those moral lessons because when I have read Louisa May Alcott's thrilling stories, there is always a moral lesson, some kind of moral moral lesson. And right. and sometimes they even frustrate me because I think it's so funny because she writes here, but sir, I thought every story should have some sort of a moral, so I took care to have a few of my sinners repent. Bella <laughs> no. oh, sorry. Oh, no. okay. She's like a pigeon. I remember reading Rose in Bloom, and there's the character of Charlie, who is like the lorry archetype. And in the beginning of the story, the narrator was like, Charlie wanted to marry Rose for her money. And then Charlie dies in the novel, and it's sad. I kind of wish that Louis Malcolm would be more strict with these guys who are like after the girl's money, or if they are harassing the female characters and I guess I think it's time period you know you can't really be too hateful to <laughs> male gender and maybe it's because of her internalized misogyny that we have talked about in Joe's case she always has a moral in even in the training stories I don't know I, I, I don't always feel satisfied when I read her training stories because I don't think all the quote-unquote villains get what they deserve. Yeah, it, it kind of makes me think. The other day I saw on someone, it was like someone put on Tumblr, like, tell me what trope you don't like to see. And, and like the first things I was thinking of was forgiving the abuser or the villain, uh, whoever it is that. And, and for some people, I, I do not disparage them if they do forgive because, like, if that's the way you heal, fine. But I hate when you have the stories that are like 
you need to forgive. You have to in order to move on. And it's like, why? And, and I speak this through personal experience. Someone in my life for quite a long while was abusive to me and to a few others. And that was all that we ever did was forgive. And the moment I told myself, like once this one event happened, and I said, you know what, I'm done forgiving, then I truly felt like I'm free of this. You know, I'm not feeling weighed down. And there are some people who are like, well, you should forgive because it's not right to be angry. But, like, I feel like for some characters, they deserve to be angry. They've earned that anger for all the years of suppressing those feelings and all those times of not being allowed to feel angry or feel free and instead of feeling terrified and sad well I guess I will forgive you because you said you're sorry and and I do believe in giving people like second chances if they really do deserve it but for some people they just say sorry because they know they say sorry they've got a safety net they can come back and just do the same thing and that was just what was happening in my situation I was just like I can't that's the only way I can move on is to say, no, I'm not forgiving you. If it's what helps you to heal, to not forgive, fine. Because there are just some people who haven't changed. Some people who don't deserve to be forgiven because when you did forgive them, it never got through their head that what they did was wrong. But you sit in there going, I'm not going to forgive you. Really, your hope sinks in. And, like, the only time, to my knowledge, the sort of I forgive you sort of trope worked was the live-action Cinderella, because she says it, and then it's like, out the door she goes, I forgive you, and I'll never think of you again. And that's what really kind of hits her, is like, I'm going to be forgotten, like Lady Tremaine, she's like, I'll, not, I'll never be thought of again, nothing that I've done has imprinted on her and Cinderella is just like, whatever, I forgive you. And that's fine. But I'm also at this point, will never think of you again, just because it is the quote unquote Christian thing to do. That's often what you hear in fiction. That doesn't mean forgiving a bad person is the right call. You gotta see someone actually doing better in order to, make the forgiveness work. So yeah, that that's my long rant of one of my <laughs> least favorite tropes in fiction is the pressure to give in to forgiving uh, an individual who's not really the greatest person and actually is a downright horrible person. That reminded me how in Ever After, True Barry Mouse Cinderella, she says the same to Angelica Houston. I forgive you, but I'll never think of you again. Yeah. I think it's some kind of a Cinderella trope. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly enough. In Work, Story of Experience, which is uh, another Louisa May Alcott book, like, there's a character called Fletcher, and he harasses this Christine, who is the main character, Christy. And then Fletcher dies. Fletcher gets wounded in the war, and then he asks her to forgive him, and she does. I think it's interesting how in a lot of Lewis and Albert books, when there is this kind of character who harasses the female character, like Charlie and, and uh, Fletcher, and even Laurie, the woman, like Laurie actually asks Joe to forgive him because he was, I, I don't remember what word, word he uses, that he was being silly earlier or something like that. He, he definitely minimizes the way he treated her. And then... Joe forgives him, and then she's like, we can never go back to childhood, but we can still be be friends, and you can be my brother. That's never in any of movies or adaptations how Laurie actually asks Joe to forgive him, but then they don't never show the entire part of him harassing her. But I think during this time period, it was very difficult to question male authority, that's why these men either die and then in their deathbeds these women forgive them. Yeah. That's what I think. 
like with Lori, like you said, you know, at least he apologizes and does give this speech about like, I'm sorry that what I, that I was that way. And now that you're both in your right places, I can, as he says, I can honestly share my heart between sister Joe and wife Amy, love them dearly. Will you believe it? He at least is able to sort of give a little bit more of a convincing display of like maturity and really say, you know, like, I'm sorry. Like it, it really was shitty of me to be, to put it bluntly that, you know, I did this to you, but I hope you can see that I am much better now and can love you, but now as my sister and friend, hopefully we can move on from there. Yeah, I feel like at the very least you got to show that you've matured enough and prove that you have done something better as Amy said do something to make yourself worthy of Joe's love and well he was able to kind of recapture her familial love love as a sister and friend by maturing being able to have her forgiveness because she can see like yeah you you've grown you're my friend and I see hints of my old Teddy now that he's not so love stuck on me I, it doesn't convince me when I see, you know, stories that they're like, oh my God, I'm just so sorry, forgive me, because I'm close to death, and okay, that, I don't feel like that really shows much of anything, you're just scared, you're gonna die with this bad thing on your conscience, but whatever. <laughs> it's probably also connected to Christianity that these particular characters that I mentioned, that they ask forgiveness in their deathbeds. Yeah. yeah. I see a lot of stories of parents that are like, please come to me. I want to tell you I'm sorry. Forgive me and bless. Sometimes they just want to be like, too bad for your conscience. You're you're not sorry. It's just like, ow. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say this way, but like how my mom sometimes says like, oh yeah, well they got nicer because they know they're closer to death. <laughs> like, it's a horrible thing to say, but like, it, it's somewhat true that when you know that death is nearby, you you get a little bit nicer because you don't want regret before leaving and you want everything to be okay. Whether or not you do believe in an afterlife or not, you want to go in completely clean slate and, and good. Following Mr. Dashwood's directions and making Miss Northbury her model, Joe rashly took a plunge into the frothy sea of sensational literature. But thanks to the life preserver thrown her by a friend, she came up again not much worse for her ducking. Like most young scribblers, she went abroad for her characters and scenery. And Benditi, counts and gypsies, nuns, and duchesses appeared on her stage and played their parts with such accuracy and spirit as could be expected. Her readers were not particular about such trifles as grammar, punctuation, and probability, and Mr. Dashway graciously permitted her to fill his columns at the lowest prices, not thinking it necessary to tell her that the real cause of his hospitality was that fact that one of his half, on being offered higher wages, had basically left him in lord, for a emancipated purse through stout and the little horde she was making to take back to the mountains next summer grew slowly but surely as the weeks passed. One thing disturbed her satisfaction, and that was that she did not tell them at home. She had a feeling that mother and father would not approve, and preferred to have her own way first, and beg pardon afterwards. It was easy to keep her secret, for no name appeared with her stories. Mr. Deathwood had, of course, found it, found it out very soon, but promised to be dumb, and for a wonder kept his word. She thought it would do her no harm, for she sincerely meant to write nothing of which she should be ashamed of, and quieted all her subconscious by anticipation of a happy minute when she should show her earnings and laugh over her well-kept secret. Mr. Dashwood rejected anything but thrilling tales, and the thrills could not be produced except by harrowing up the souls of the readers history and romance, land and sea, science and 
art, police records, and lunatic asylums had to be ransacked for the purpose. Jo soon found that her innocent, innocent experience had been given to her but a few glimpses of the tragic world which underlies society. So, regarding in its a business light, she set about supplying her defenses with characteristic energy, eager to find material for stories, and bent on making them original in thought, if not masterly in execution. She searched newspapers for accidents, incidents, and crimes. She excited the suspicions of public librarians by asking for work on poison, studied faces in the street, and characters, good, bad, and indifferent, all about her. She delved in the dust of ancient times for facts or fiction so old that they were as good as new, and introduced herself to folly, sin, and misery, as well as her limited opportunities allowed. She thought she was prospering finally, but unconsciously she was beginning to desecrate some of the womanliest attributes of a woman's character. She was living in bad society, and imaginary though it was, its influence affected her, for she was feeding heart and fancy on dangerous and unsubstantial food, and was fast brushing the innocent bloom of her nature by a premature acquaintance with the darker side of life, which comes soon enough to all of us. Yeah, somebody commented very recently on my YouTube how Louisa May Alcott likes like to write about Spaniards in her stories. Spaniards and French and um, Germans. So she definitely did paste her stories to Europe and romantic countries. Yeah, and admittedly, I do that a lot with whenever I try to have been writing a story, write of England. But I think that's just, I, I went to study abroad and I loved it so much that part of me is just like, this is a way to sort of get back there. Sometimes you write because it's like far off places because it's so different from yours. They follow different rules or they have things there that you don't have here, depending on what time period it is. I could definitely see why she would feel the urge to write out. Because it's almost kind of like being able to explore the world just from the safety of your own home, too. And it's funny how we just talked about her being disposable. When it says that Mr. Dashwood graciously permitted her to fill his columns at the lowest prices, not thinking it necessary to tell her that the real cause of his hospitality was the fact that one of his acts on being offered higher wages had basically left him in the lurch. She writes these stories and she thinks it's, she, it's just great, but she's the lowest wages and she gets to fill his columns. It's not even like a good minimum wage, it is just, it's cheating out somebody of their right. And and the, and the fact that he refers to his writers as hacks, too, it's like, he doesn't even have respect for them. And just, and, and I don't know if it's also because she's also a woman, so she gets a little bit of a lower wage, too. But like, to think that she puts all that effort into it reading articles and studying people and going to libraries to look up stuff and she's putting so much effort into it only to get like they don't say it in this chapter but just let's just say a quarter compared to what that guy probably got which was a dollar or 75 cents like yeah it's just it's it's really it's sad and and it gets me too when when it says her readers were not particular about such trifles as grammar, punctuation, probability, that would drive me nuts because I, I also am like an English minor. That is like one of the biggest things like that bothers me. Like, you know, the grammar and the punctuation is like, mm, the, the, the comma should have been there. And the, and the mm, uh, why, why is there, you know, two, uh, two ands and, and why, why doesn't this make sense when just the page before you said her dress was blue and now her dress is red and there wasn't even a moment of which, you know, she changed her dress. Like, it's just, like, even if, you know, let's just say whatever, she's not writing sensational stories, she's writing a very genuine story. The fact that the readers are not particularly 
do about stuff like that, it means she'll get kind of like kind of slack on on her grammar and punctuation, and it will affect the serious work she wants to do. Like it's just those like a little details that just even if you could try to make an argument of oh well the sensational stories are good for her well it's on basic writing etiquette grammar punctuation and probability it's really messing her up it, and it will translate to your other writings because you you get so used to writing it that way that when you get to writing a different story it will carry over you won't think about it until someone points it out yeah i i agree i've come across people who say that oh writing sensational stories was good practice for joe but i don't think so this is not good literature this is something very cheap and her talents are being used in ways that is not good for her yeah. Like, she could be doing so many other good things with her talents than this. Right, and she doesn't even have an employer who respects her. He just sees her as just another writer to fill his columns. Again, even if you could sit there and say, well, the sensational writings are good, it's not helping her to know how to see what is a good employer and what's a bad employer, because he's not a good employer. He's paying her very cheaply, and taking advantage of her inexperience in the publishing world. I can really relate to this chapter because when I did some of my first illustration jobs, one of my first clients was not rude, but always asking these changes after I had finished one piece and then another piece. And it was just non-stop and the payment wasn't so great. I don't really care to talk about it because I don't want to remember it. And it's so interesting when I read Louisa May Alcott's censored journals about her time of working for Frank Leslie. I always get this feeling that she was ashamed of that she worked in this magazine. The thing is, you do silly things when you are young and we all do them. You don't know. You don't have experiences. So it's one experience among others. But still, I can understand why she didn't really like to promote that particular time period in her life. Yeah, it's just like um, my dad. Like, I've been trying to like write since like high school, or at least I've been truly kind of getting into that idea. And my dad will always tell me, like, oh, she's writing a trilogy, because that was the first thing I told myself I was going to write. I'm like, Dad, you need to stop saying that, because that story's not going to happen. He's like, why? I'm like, because... When I look back on it, it was such a dated, like, it was something that definitely, sort of in the nicest way possible, I could say, because I have done this myself. It is very 2000s fan fiction written by a girl, where it's very, like, oh, these dudes, those are, like, old-fashioned tropes and triangle between the bad boy who's kind of low-key abusive and, you know, this and when I'm like, it's just, it's cringeworthy. Like, but they love reading cringeworthy stuff. I'm like, no, Dad, no, no, they don't. <laughs> and this will never see the light of day. So that's probably like the closest I have to sort of identifying with her sort of sensational writing is like, it's not my greatest work. <laughs> and it may have appealed to a certain audience at a time, but when looking back, it is like, it's kind of an old shame. I'm like, but it was a good start for me. And, and now to, for me to sit back and go, okay, this is not my best work. I, I'm so glad to see I've improved since then. And I can just safely just put that far away and not have anybody see it. But yeah, it, it was not. And, I didn't, and it wasn't like I learned really anything from it. It was just I was in high school, never really got to experience much of anything in my life. And it wasn't until college years when I met people from other places and got to have this more open-minded idea of how things could be, did I start to really go like, okay, 
this is when my writing improved. That piece of shit that I wrote back then didn't help me improve my writing. If I continued to use that as a format, I would be a terrible writer. I would, I would be horrible. I look at it with a sort of like, I'm glad to see I improved, but I don't use that as a, oh, that was a stepping point and what a great lesson because I didn't learn that lesson until many years later. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think that when people try to say, well, she's learning from sensational, it's like, well, what are you learning? Really? You're, you're not learning how to write properly. You're writing how to write as the time is or what people want, not really what is true to how you feel or what you want to write. And the best that you can use it for is the look back, really. I think I read it from one of Louis Malcolm's journals. And it was written during the time when she was writing these sensational stories. And there is a quote where she says that she stuck with this story and she doesn't want to write it. She doesn't want to add the, the gory details or whatever the editor is asking. And there's a moment where she writes that Emerson tells her to write something that she enjoys and study character. So we have the Friedrich Bear connection there. But it's so interesting how... People say that, oh, this was a good thing for Joe. Like, oh, Joe is a feminist when she writes these stories. I'm like, she's not a feminist. She's getting paid really poorly. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not even like writing, even let's just say in a very sloppy way, writing a strong female character or a type of character. Again, I just think back of like the sort of era of tropes where like, the hero girl or the lead lead girl is the not like other girls or she's the action girl and pretty much any girl she encounters is a quote unquote slut or quote unquote bitch or quote unquote weak because she doesn't do if she's not pretty much who what the lead girl is, she's not the best character. But like it's like, yeah, well girls can be kick ass and if you're not picking up the sword and doing what I'm doing, well then, you're not feminist. It's the one extreme of feminist that is not good. We're, we're, we went from, like, it's not feminist to want to stay at home and just be the mother. So if you're not doing that, even though if it is what you want to do, that's not feminist. Like, so it's not even like that there's that, where it's like, oh, we have this really cool female character who's breaking a mold, even if it is kind of has a little bit of misogyny in it. It's just these gory stories that don't even offer some sort of like conflict or sort of thought. Like, like I just think of Poe. Like with Poe, at least, even if the story is kind of gory or horrifying, there is still this backstory to it or there is this sort of thought of let's just say the telltale heart it does provoke thought of was the old man really this evil character that deserved to die or was the young man just just had evil in his heart and is that inherent in every person or can someone be as bad and at least those kind of stories do help for Folks, some sort of thought and question of human nature, whereas these stories are just bloody and gory, and it's like, why bother? And another thing that just made me think of it, I hate when people call certain movies horror movies when really it's just a war fest. Again, when I was in high school, I watched this movie called The Woman in Black with Daniel Radcliffe, and I liked it a lot. I thought it was genuinely scary because the idea of this ghost that will drive children to their death is like terrifying but when I was talking about it in class the next day some, some girl was like yeah I watched that it wasn't scary enough there wasn't like a blood at all and I'm like that's what makes it scary for you like if, like if you were the type of person that is like oh blood makes me queasy and it really is horrifying to me and that's what will scare me I guess but like Blood does not always equal horror. And most horror movies 
are supposed to be a thought-provoking kind of tale, you know, because I'm looking at my copy of it now, Carrie, and it's scary to think that one minute you have this sort of quote-unquote nobody, and then the next day they be a holy terror, destroying a whole town, but what does it say that this kid who has been bullied and has nobody to help her deal with her emotions and then finally blows up in the most deadly way possible. Like, there's always at least some sort of... This episode is sponsored by Etsy. On Etsy, you can start your own store and reach a lot of people in their popular platform. If you have ever considered starting an Etsy store, this is your chance. And with the link in the description, you can get your first 40 listings for free. You can sell pretty much anything on Etsy from your own artworks, clothing and toys to vintage items and digital products. But behind horror stories, so, and I just feel like when, when you read this chapter and it describes what the sensational stories are like, it's just blood and guts and murders and people that have no, there is no sort of moral to it or even just thought what provokes the readers to think beyond this, why did this person kill that person? Is there any reason? Nope, just to just to be a, an asshole? Oh, okay. So yeah, I, I think that there's a difference, I think, between sensational stories and thoughtful stories, just as I feel there's a difference between the horror movies and the gore porn, as they call it, horror porn or horror movies. Just to be gory, just for the sake of it, to be disgusting. Thank you so much for listening. Christina and I continue our chat next time. Take care and make good choices. Bye.